and welcome to our monthly Foster Home training presentation on Facebook for ESRA. Um, thank you again so much for fostering ESRA dogs. You're making a huge difference and what we want to do is help you make that difference more easily and have more fun doing it more efficiently and keep making those great springers available for adoption. So welcome and we're going to get started. Um, today we're going to talk about barking and as usual I want you to uh, put your, your comments into the Facebook comments as we progress so that our team can put them together and we can answer your questions at the end of the presentation. So here we go. So barking. What we're going to talk about is too much barking, mostly. Um, you know, maybe there's too little barking. We're not really going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about barking in the wrong context, inappropriate barking, and so forth. So barking is a natural dog behavior. It's innate. That means it's instinctive and it begins in puppyhood. It begins around two to three weeks of age with those little cute puppy sounds that develop naturally into a bark as the puppy grows up. But it also develops with learning because that's how it gets used in different contexts. That's how the dog learns to use it in different ways. It develops different tonations and so forth as the dog gets older. So if it's a behavior and if some of it's learned, why can't we just unlearn it? Why can't we just make it stop? So I hope you already know the answer to that because that's never the best way to deal with behavior, just making it stop. Um, it's always best to get to the bottom of it, to get to why the dog is barking. And that's mostly what we're going to talk about today, and we are going to get to some solutions. So, barking is a symptom. So what we have to do is find out why they're barking, what's driving the barking, and what, you know, what the dog wants to accomplish from this barking, if, if anything. So let's start looking at the science first. Alexandra Protopopova reported that barking can serve functions of communicating, communicating that they want to play, expressing fear, changing boredom, or expressing threat towards someone else. Martins and Unsholm reported more barking among group house dogs than single house dogs in kennels. Boitani and Suchi, among others, noted that feral and stray dogs rarely bark. Think about that. Some of you may have had experience with that. Interesting. Malinar and others found that barks are more uniform among different dogs in contexts evoking aggressive motivations, whereas happy, anticipatory, and requesting barks are more specific to individuals. So I'll repeat that in different words because it's kind of complex. So aggressive barks are fairly similar among dogs and easy to recognize, whereas happy and barks of anticipation and barks where dogs are asking for something are more specific to the individual, which is interesting. There's no evidence to date that barking is communicative between dogs, other than in the Lady and the Tramp movie, which is not real evidence. That's not science, that's entertainment, and this is science. So, it is true that Maros and Molnar and some other people found that dogs could distinguish between recorded barks that were made in different situations and different motivations. In other words, if, if a dog was barking because a stranger was approaching, or they were barking because it was time for a walk, other dogs, when they recorded those barks, could tell the difference between those. They also found that dogs may be able to distinguish between the barks of different individual dogs. So that seems to lead to the possibility that, that it's communicative between dogs, but there's not enough information yet to support that finding. Um, I'm sure there's more research going on, so we'll see as time goes on. However, it appears that barking 
does have a communicative role in, in dog and human interactions. How about that? So Morton found that humans, as a rule, whether they're dog people or not, can tell the difference between aggressive and friendly vocalizations in many species, not just dogs, which makes sense because that's a survival thing, right? It's, it's good if humans can tell if an animal is barking aggressively like they're gonna attack them. Um, so, um, Lynn, Lynn Kosky contributed to that too. But, um, you know, something to think about. So to summarize, what we do know about barking from science is barking is functional. It's used for communication, invitations to play, fear, boredom, or threat. Barking happened more among large groups of dogs staying together than in single house dogs and kennels. Aggressive motivations produce similar barks among dissimilar dogs. And barking is used as communication with humans, but not so much with dogs. So now we're going to get to analyzing your barking problem with your dog or your foster dog. So in order to analyze the problem, which we have to analyze it before we can solve it, right? We have to see what's going on. So the first thing we're going to look at is those functions of barking. So one thing that we know also is that barking is self-reinforcing because it's an innate behavior. Dogs can experience the joy of barking, and I'm sure you've seen it. Bark, 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 this is so much fun. It's natural, it's innate, though it is enhanced through learning. But barking and excitement can feel good and be fun. And that's kind of a problem. Um, it can, while it's also chasing away boredom and squirrels, it's fun. So that's why it's kind of hard to change. Barking can be used to express fear. This is a distance increasing function. So dogs use behaviors as distance increasing behaviors and as distance decreasing behaviors, which we'll talk about in a minute. But when you're afraid of something, you're going to try to increase the distance between you and that thing. So if you're a dog, you're going to bark and say, oh, go away, you know, maybe while you're backing up or whatever. Um, and you're using that for self-protection through that distance. So they may be barking at other dogs, at other animals, at people, um, inanimate objects, cars, bicycles, who knows what it is. But they, you, by their body language, we can tell they want it to go away. With fear, of course, their body language is going to be backward. They're going to be pulling back, shifting their weight back, maybe moving backward. Um, even their, you know, their ears will be back, their tail will be back and down and under. Their, even their mouths will be back. So the corners of their mouths will be, uh, ar, 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 you know, that kind of really pulled back. So that's fear, and, and it can play a role in on-leash reactivity if you have that problem. Um, when barking is used to express a threat to others, it's also a distance increasing behavior, but it takes a little bit different form. They also want the thing to go away, and they're using it for self-protection. But what you'll see is different body language, where the dog's weight is shifted forward. They're more, you know, they're up on their front legs, their ears are forward, their tail would probably be up and forward as much as it can get it there. Um, and even there, their weight will be shifted forward up over their front legs. They may be moving forward. And even their mouth. So you look for that C mouth. If we turn to the side, the, the corners of the mouth are going to be forward. Or it's like a C shape. Or, 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 or. That's your threatening bark, as opposed to the fear bark, which is ar, 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 with the corners pulled back. So I hope you've all already done the dog reading course and you remember all this. If not, Please do it. It'll really help, and it's a really good foundation for all the things you need to do with your dogs. Um, you can also review it if you have the link. So, another function of barking, as we're analyzing why this dog is barking so much, could be communicating with humans. Now, there is passive communication with humans where when a dog is doing some kind of alarm barking, whether it's threatening or fearful, then the, the human family may hear that, and when they recognize it, they may go and eliminate the threat, which benefits both them and the dog. But dogs do bark 
to more actively communicate with humans. And that's what we're talking about. So the first one is going to be to get something, to bark for consequences. And as you remember, everybody learns in two ways, association and consequences. And dogs do bark to get what they want. The thing is, that barking has been reinforced. So while it's often called demand barking, to me that puts a lot of responsibility on the dog to have created this when in fact this is created by humans. This is created because the dog barked and he got what he wanted because you know what reinforcement is. Reinforcement happens after a behavior, it's contingent on a behavior, and it increases the behavior. So if the dog barks, he gets what he wants, guess what? You're training him to bark. Maybe you didn't do it. Maybe the previous person that did it. But if you maintain it, off it goes. You need to actively change it if that's what's going on. So in order to discern this, you need to pay attention to what happens after the dog barks, right? So look for what that reinforcer is that happens right after the barking. Be aware of human behavior. Is a human coming along and giving them something? Of course, because it's self-reinforcing, if the dog's standing out in the middle of the yard and just having a good time barking, that's what's happening. So we're going to talk about how to solve that too. Um, and also, you know, nature can reinforce it. But, you know, they bark, something accidentally happens. Here you go, there's a reinforcer. But we can change our human behavior. So we also want to look at what's happening right before the barking starts because that's setting the environment for the barking, right? So a lot of times we see a lot of barking at mealtime, right? Because they're excited and they get used to barking. Dogs may bark when they want to go out. Dogs may bark when they want you to throw the ball. They may bark when it's time for a walk. They may bark when you get the leash out. And you have to be super careful. Are they, are they getting what they want when they're barking? One really common one, I'm sure you've heard of this, it's, you know, it's been mentioned for years, but it's a fantastic analogy. So when the mailman comes up to the door to put the mail in the mailbox and the dog barks, guess what? The mailman goes away. So the dog can literally learn to bark to make the mailman go away. Now the dog doesn't know that the mailman is going to leave anyway. He may think that he caused it from the barking. Doesn't matter what he thinks, though. It is very possible that he barks, mailman goes away, and now he's going to increase his barking. Because that's how you train dogs. So this consequence-inducing barking can take a couple of forms. One is excitement and arousal. So you have to check and see what's got him over threshold. Because it, it could also have a component of fear or threat involved at this point. Because once a dog becomes aroused and over threshold, he's just barking and now he's not thinking. It may have started out thinking, but it's not anymore. So we have to look at that body language and see what's going on. The other one could be um, distance decreasing behavior. So dogs will bark in invitation. Do, do you see me over here? Bark, bark, bark. Don't you want to come play with me? And, and you'll, see, you'll see that. Maybe you just don't like the barking, um, but it is less problematic than a dog that's barking out of fear or out of threat. So sometimes another function is dogs will bark out of frustration. It can be a release when they're frustrated, just, ah, I don't know what to do, bark, bark, bark. It could be to get some self-reinforcement. When they're conflicted, they're confused, they don't know what else to do. Um, a lot of times this happens in a training session with a dog. And again, this is a, a human, possibly a human-induced thing, where maybe your training session isn't that clear for the dog. Maybe he knows the food is there, but he can't understand how to get the treats. Um, sometimes when we're training, we're asking too much of dogs. And it's taken a really long time for him to ever be able to give us the behavior we're looking for. So we may need to make it easier so he can get the treats faster and then build up to that more complex behavior. So it, it may indicate a problem with your training technique, so fix that. It can also be they were chasing a rat, the rat went under the fence and they can't get it, and now they're really frustrated. 
So nature can bring frustration also. Dogs, some dogs will bark out of stress and anxiety directly. So the barking could be a release of that stress, or it could be just an expression of emotion. It can generalize to a lot of situations quickly. So if it works in one situation, the dog is more likely to bark in others. It can become his go-to behavior. And speaking of generalization, there is, there's another study that I didn't mention in the beginning that shows that the function of barking can change. So if they're first barking out of frustration and they get that self-reinforcing feeling from the barking, then say something else goes on, like they want to have their meal and they see it being prepared, the, they may bark there because, hey, it worked to make them feel better in the frustration situation. So maybe it'll make them get their meal faster. So generalization happens really quickly with things that feel good like that. Um, okay, so we're gonna determine the function of the body. The next thing we need to do is look at the stimuli that happened before the body starts. So what that means is look at what else is going on around the dog. Look at the environment. Because if the dog was not barking, and now he is barking, something changed in the environment. And if you can figure out what that is, that's gonna help you change the behavior. So first, what does it seem like the dog is barking at? What is he orienting toward? Um, okay, and here's, here's my safety talk. If a dog is barking at you, and it's anything but playful, you need to stop immediately, stop everything that's happening, get yourself and the dog out of the situation, you know, close the door between yourself and the dog, give everybody a chance to calm down, and then start over, make a plan to solve the problem. Because if a dog is barking at you out of arousal or frustration, it can very quickly become a threatening bark. And we want to stop you know, the behavior is never remains the same. It's always moving along a trajectory. And if that trajectory is heading toward threatening you, then that's heading toward biting you. And so we want to turn that the first chance we get, not wait till it gets to that point. I know you know what I'm talking about. Um, so then we stop everything. We make a plan to solve the problem. Okay, so back to the stimuli causing the barking, assuming it's not you. If it's other things, look at what he's orienting toward, and then go back and think about what that function is. So if he's orienting toward a dog he sees out the window walking along the sidewalk, what does it look like? What does his body language look like? Does it look like fear? Does it look like threat? Does it look like play behaviors? What's, what's happening? Is it distance increasing behavior or distance decreasing behavior? because then you have something you can work with. By the way, on a side note, when an animal wants to kill another animal, it's generally very quiet. You're not gonna have barking in that situation because if an animal perceives another animal as prey, he doesn't want to increase distance. He doesn't want to scare his prey away. He's just gonna quietly stalk it and then he's gonna go kill it. Now that doesn't mean that barking in arousal or stress can't take the dog over threshold, get him closer to the animal, you know, everybody's wired up, things go bad, he gets the animal in the corner and, you know, he could kill an animal. That's not what I'm talking about. That certainly we want to minimize arousal and over threshold behavior. Take it away if possible. But killing doesn't happen with barking. As a general rule. So, all right, so we've looked at the function. We've looked at whatever changed in the environment to start the barking. And then we want to take a good close look at the communications accompanying the barking, which I've already mentioned, but it's really important. And basically, if you can tell if that animal's body language is forward, if he's pushing forward, shifting his weight forward, everything is forward, that C mouth, the corners of his mouth are forward, 
That's one thing. If it's fearful, pulling back, weight shift back, um, cordyceps of his mouth pulled back. Or is it playful? Is he wiggling and bouncing and doing exaggerated movements, doing play doll? That's a whole different thing. And then is it excitement leading into arousal or possibly already having arrived at arousal? That's going to be those frantic, stiff, jerky movements where they're, they're stiff, their back is straight, it's not curving. Um, it's not a hard mouth. If you offer them a treat at that time, you know, their jaw's tight too, so they'll be, boom, period, they'll be real grabby with the treats. So look at that, because all of these causes can work together to help you plan what the opposite behavior that you're going to try to reinforce is, is what that behavior is in that situation that's going to work to create a different behavior besides the barking, right? So again, prevent what you don't want, reinforce the opposite of what you don't want, right? Sometimes barking can help humans finally see the problem. And that's not the best thing. Um, you might not have noticed a brewing problem until the barking started. And that's another reason I really encourage you to do the dog reading course because I want you to see, be able to clearly see the things leading up to the barking so you can prevent it because it turns out better. Um, but we can do it. So remember that the problem that's causing the barking probably started way before the barking did, and that's how we're going to fix it. We're going to back up through the barking and through those precursor behaviors so that we can reinforce something else early. That's basically what's happening here. So now, finally, finally, we're going to talk about solutions. So I want to talk about three things, three big topics. One is, as I already sort of alluded to, you have to get in front of the barking. Get in front of it. You have to be able to predict it to reinforce things that come before the barking early so you can turn it away from that trajectory toward the barking. You have to reinforce opposite behaviors. And you know, I use the word opposite loosely because there, there may be a lot of opposite behaviors. In this case, they're gonna be behaviors that are accompanied by quiet on the part of the dog. So we can pick out which ones work best in the situation where we have the problem. And we'll talk about that more. So I'm going to talk a lot about an exercise called Look at That, which was named that by Leslie McDevitt in her book, Control Unleashed. It's a very simple exercise, and tons of people have used it and call it different things. I love to call it Look at That because you can shorten it to L-A-T. And I just like it. So um, this particular exercise, which I'm going to demonstrate in a few minutes with Al, if I can wake him up, works to prevent barking and, and the other behaviors that lead up to it. it. Those emotional responses that lead to barking. It also works to modify almost any barking situation. It teaches, it, it allows you, it doesn't teach, it allows you to teach the dog an alert that's, come get me. If you see something that, that is so exciting to you or so threatening to you, or so whatever to you, that you feel like you need to bark, come get me instead, without barking. And it can really make a big difference. So, um, okay, the third one is, just like with most other behaviors that have already spun out of control, if a dog is already in the midst of barking his head off, you just have to get out of the situation. You just have to stop it, because He's no longer thinking. That's the definition of being over threshold, and that's what's happening. The dog's barking his head off at another dog, at whatever. He's no longer thinking. He is over threshold, just acting on impulse and instinct, and he's out of control at that point. So you just have to stop it, get out of the situation as quickly and cleanly as possible, because you can't train when he's in that state. Once everybody's calmed down, then you can create a training plan in a situation you can control and you can teach them a new behavior. So in specific situations, if dogs are barking 
to access that self-reinforcement, then what we want to do is basically teach the dog other fun activities that are linked to quiet and can take up his time. And then he can choose instead of barking. So it, it may have just become a habit. You know, when you do something a lot, you create a neural pathway in your brain that leads you there. And generalization is part of that, trying barking in different situations. So if that's what's happened, the dog's just going to go bark because he knows that feels good and he doesn't know anything else to do. So when we increase his repertoire with sniffing games, sniffing games are usually very quiet. Um, hide and seek games and food puzzles. And we do that a lot every day with him until he starts to look for those behaviors. And then maybe he starts to initiate a sniffing game on his own in the backyard. And then you see him moving away from the barking. But you're still going to have to prevent the barking um, as much as possible in order for it to go away because it's still easy for him to access. What we're doing is providing a variety of things he can easily access, just as easily access as the barking, and then he'll start to choose some of those. So if the dog is barking to communicate with humans, then basically we're going to teach a different kind of alert to exciting things. Again, as I said before, instead of barking, come to me. You know, you can even add another alert. You can add, you know, touch my leg with your nose touch my foot with your, your paw, and I'll follow you so you can show me what's so exciting, and there will be lots of treats involved. We can, we can get that game going by using a look at that exercise. So if the dog is barking to get something specifically, to, to get a specific consequence, like meal time or to go outside or to get you to put his leash on or whatever, then we're just going to train another behavior that we can reinforce instead of barking. It could be a sit, a down, a target behavior. Make sure barking doesn't accompany it. In fact, I mean, in general, I love sit for this. If we teach dogs to sit, to say please, sort of, you'll see them using it all the time because it's easy. It doesn't take a lot of energy. It probably takes less energy than barking. And if they can get what they want by doing that, and we take an active hand in teaching them that, then why would they bark? It's easier. So, um, but you have to define that sit as sit quietly, because a dog can certainly bark while sitting. So that starts in your brain, making the plan, creating the vision of the dog sitting quietly at the door, maybe. And then he's, he's looking at you, looking at you. And, and you need to get over there and let him out, because he's not barking. He's making an effort to not bark. Because you know what? If you don't come, he is going to bark in those early stages. Because barking has always worked in that situation. See what I mean? So we have to start by always reinforcing that behavior. And then we can help it take the place of the barking over time. Um, so what we're going to look at is we're going to use, use this behavior when the dog clearly wants something, food or toy or go outside or whatever. How can he get it instead of barking? Um, we're going to, if, if the dog is barking for distance decreasing purposes, come over here, come play with me or whatever. We're going to, again, offer what he wants when he's quiet. So this most often occurs when you're on the other side of the door or you're outside the crate and he's inside the crate or you're on the other side of the baby game, right? He's confined in some way and he wants you to come get him or he wants to come with you, right? So we have to, again, get in front of the barking. If he's already barking, he's already over threshold, you cannot train in that situation. You have to just get out of the situation and then create a controlled situation to train it. However, if you can get there before the barking begins, and we're talking about running. You know, if your dog's in the crate, you're in another room, he's quiet, you were going to go get him in a few minutes anyway. Run in there for heaven's sakes and try to get there before the barking starts. It's helpful if you've taught a sit too because that will help him be more quiet because if he's standing in his crate dancing, that can lead to barking, right? 
So if, if he learns that Sidney gets you to open his great door, take down the baby gate or open the door and, and go inside or let him out, that's going to really help you. But it works really well if you look at it like the red light, green light game. So you move toward the quiet dog. What if you're still 10 feet away and he starts barking? What are you going to do? Stop. Stop in your tracks. Make a very dramatic change in, in the environment, which is your behavior right there that's affecting it. So you're going to just stop. Maybe you're going to cross your arms, look away. Maybe you turn to the side or even to the back. Maybe you even take one step back, depending on what it takes to get that dog to stop barking. Now, we don't want to go back to the place where we started, for sure, because it was hard enough for the dog to be quiet at this point. Um, so you'll never get there if you just keep going back to the beginning. But certainly stop. Maybe take one step back. The second he pauses in his barking, maybe he kind of stops to take a breath or he goes, hmm, why won't they come? You begin moving forward. Very dramatically, make it very different from when you stopped. And in that way, you'll get to him. When you get to him, same thing. Reach down for the crate door, he starts barking, take your hand away. Reach down again when he's quiet, he starts barking, take your hand away. Very dramatic changes will communicate to the dog, you have control over this, buddy. When your little mouth is closed, I will do everything I can to get that crate door open. But if you start barking before I can do it, I have to stop. So you have to be fair again. Move fast. Don't be going really slow and trying to get more out of him because his reinforcer is getting to you in this case because we've established that he's trying to use barking to decrease distance between you and him. So we got to go fast. Now later, we can, we can do some proofing. We can get some duration. But not right now, because what will happen is maybe he was doing distance increase, distance decreasing barking, but then he gets so frustrated because he can't get to you. Now he's going to bark out of frustration. So you've, you know, you failed at that point. So be quick. Um, all right, moving on to fear, and if, if the dog is barking out of fear or barking to express a threat towards something, the response is basically the same. We're going to reduce stress. We're going to condition the dog to like or to respond positively to whatever was causing him to bark. And all of that can start with the look at that game. Um, if the dog's barking in frustration, we have to really look at our behavior. Be careful the dog understands what he can do to make the treat happen or to make whatever reinforcer happen, like opening the crate door, opening the door for um, and we have to make sure the rate of reinforcement is high enough. So if he's barking in frustration, he doesn't understand, and the rate of reinforcement is not high enough. So just change that, and you'll get it. Um, okay, if the, bark's, if the dog's barking out of stress and anxiety, of course you reduce stress. You condition relaxation. You condition him to like things around him, and you work on that level. Establish a strict routine. And the barking will fall away, most likely. All right. So now we're going to see if we can get Mr. Albert to show us how to do the look at that game. Because for me, every time I bring a dog into my home, they play the look at that game. It's fantastic for preventing bad responses to things. I do it on walks when they see dogs. I do it when somebody comes up to the door. There's so many applications. And so, okay. First of all, the look at that exercise is in an article that's on the Foster Home Facebook group files. It's, the article is called Teaching Reactive Dogs a New Habit. There's a part one and a part two. And the part two article is all about the look at that exercise. So if Beth is here, perhaps she could put a link to that. That would be really cool. But it's in there, and you should be able to find it. Um, the part one-ish article is about 
which open bar, which is also useful, but that's not what we're doing right now. We're doing look at that. So to describe the goal behavior of look at that, it's so small and so simple. The big mistakes that people make are by trying to complicate it. It's really simple. All you're doing is, here's your dog. And if you have if you have treats in the treat pouch and you're ready to train, you know, what's your dog going to do? Your dog's going to look at you. Comes looking at you, right? And you're like, I don't want to look at you. So I'm going to look over there. I'm not looking at you. I was looking at you. Why don't you come at you? Yeah, you're like, whatever. I'm looking at places. But I got my eye on the dog, right? So I want my clicker because we're going to use a clicker for this. You can also use a mouse click. So my dog's still staring at me because he's like, I know, but just look long enough, we're going to treat you, right? And we like dogs to look at us. But eventually, he's going to hear something or he's going to get bored and he's going to go, Oh, what's going on over there? He turns back to you. You give him a treat. That's all in the world it is. It's a head turn. And we're going to start with the dog really close to us, but ultimately we can do it with the dog farther from us. But right now, we want to teach him it is just that swivel of your neck. He looks away, he turns back, he gets a treat. Look away, turn back and get a treat. We want him to look at all kinds of things. What we're teaching him is that stimulus that, that in the past you might have gone off barking at should be now something you can look at calmly. Because the thing is, before they go off barking, they do look calmly. First they look and go, why is that dog over there? And then they make that choice to bark. So if we let them know it is okay for you to look at the dog, I don't want you to not look at it. I want you to look. Enjoy looking. Wiggle your little nose and sniff. Swivel your ears around and listen. Look. And then check with me. That's what it's about. So let's see if Al will help us. Come here, buddy. Would you like to play a game? Oh, okay. Stretch out your neck. That's good. Come here. Come here. You want to do it there? You want to not do it at all? Oh, you're so slow. Hi. All right. Want to do something? What are we going to do? Okay, so he's looking because I have treats. There it was. It's just a head turn. He was looking at the ground, so I clicked for that. How easy is that? He looked outside. So the other thing we're doing is we are changing an emotional response. Because when your dog looks at something, there's a lot going on, right? There's a lot going on inside his little dog brain where he is, you know, his emotions are coming into play. And he's, his brain is deciding which emotional response he's going to have. Is that a scary thing? Is that something that's so awful it needs to be chased off? Is that a fun thing? Um, or how should I respond? So then the emotional response takes over, and then that's what drives the barking, right? Because if he sees that that's a scary thing or something that needs to go away, he's very likely to start barking. And if you have a dog who barks in those situations, you already know that's what he's going to do. He's told you already, this is how I'm going to respond. It's not going to just change one day. Um, if 
he sees a dog that he wants to play with or a person that he really wants to interact with. And that's what drives his barking. That's also an emotional response. So his emotional response is, oh my gosh, I love you. I need you to come here right now. I can't even stand it. I'm going to die if you don't come over here. So he's also potentially over threshold, but with a different emotional response. But you still can't control him, so it's still a problem, right? So we want to change that emotional response that's going to lead to the barking, whether it's happiness or some negative emotion. We want to change it to just, I understand, Mom, I'm going to allow you to decide if I'm going to interact with this thing. And I know what to do to tell you that I want to do a thing with them or that I'm afraid and I want it to go away. Once you have that communication and you let them know, I see that, let's figure out how to get the job done together. You're not gonna have barking, because it's done. So there you go. So barking, it's a big deal. It's a whole complex set of things because it's an innate behavior, but we can change it. And um, I hope that we've given you some ideas for ways to do that. So I'm going to quit now and I'm going to see if we have any questions to answer. So the first question is uh, any tips for dogs who bark at dogs on TV? <laughs> um, the question is any tips for dogs who bark at dogs on TV? So I believe that there needs to be a study, and maybe I will do this study one day, because some dogs watch TV and other dogs don't. I've had both. Some dogs, it, it seems like, I don't know if it's something to do with their vision or what, but it's like they don't even comprehend the television. And others are like, oh, look what's happening on the TV, and listen to that doorbell on the TV and the dog barking, and they're totally interacting with it. So I, I, I'm perplexed as to why some dogs interact and, some, and others don't on the TV. But those dogs that do interact and bark at a dog that comes on TV or bark at a doorbell sound on TV, um, it's the exact same thing. So remember I was talking about look at the stimulus that presents itself. Look at how the environment changes and then the, the barking starts. It's the exact same thing. Back your way up through that. And the good news with the TV is you can, wow, the things you could do to set up training sessions. You could, you could have YouTube videos. You have a remote control. You can make it start when you want to. And as the dog is hanging out, doing other behaviors, being non-barky, being quiet, maybe he's sitting, lying down, playing with a toy, whatever he's doing, you can make that dog come on the screen, pop a treat in his mouth, and it's so to do association with that first round, right? Remember association? Dog appears, treat goes in your mouth. So we've already brought the emotional response down a little bit, and then we can start to look at that game. If the dog on TV is too much to play the look at that game, we can do things like, um, in fact, I always recommend starting the look at that game with, with not the thing that is causing the problem, right? Because a head turn can be learned, just like just here now, I was looking at Derek over in the corner much of the time, he, and then he was looking at the patio door out to the yard a couple of times, and there's nothing going on out in the yard. So we want to start that with just whatever calm thing the dog's going to look at. If the dog is afraid of dogs or threatens other dogs, we're going to start with a dog. We'll start with squirrels, birds, a bicycle going by, and all in the world we're doing is teaching him to turn that into a game. Look at the thing, look at mom, look at the thing. Look at mom. That's all the work it is. Then when he gets the game and we've taught him he can lead that game, then we're going to present a dog at a level he can take it. And when it's a TV dog, you know, 
Maybe you could find a YouTube video that's got a little bitty dog right in the center, like it's taken from a, a, a distance, so the dog is small. Maybe the dog's quiet and not barking. We play the look at, game, look at that game with that image that we can control. Then we lead up to a bigger dog, and then a barking dog, but we turn the volume way down. So really, dogs on TV, you have a lot of control with that. So that would be a really great thing to train. When you're training with real dogs, what I do a lot of times is I have life-size stuffed dogs, and I'll start with those. Like I'll place them at whatever distance the dog can perceive them, but still look calmly and go, what? And I can start reinforcing right away. I'll even put them where they're halfway behind the tree or something. Um, and it's a stuffed dog that looks like a dog. It doesn't smell like a dog. Doesn't move like a dog, doesn't make a sound. So I've, I've isolated some of those qualities, and then I can build to a real dog behind a fence where I can control the distance. So does that make sense? Okay. Next question. Um, this is like a two-parter. Uh, so the first one has to do. There's not exactly a question here, but it's just talking about uh, when they come home, dog one of the dogs uh, barking and howling loudly and carrying on for a few minutes until they've, you know, greeted the dog and said they're happy to see you. There's, there's not really a question there, but I don't know if there's anything you can comment. There's a second part. Well, okay. There is some more? Yes. Okay, well, so, so what Derek's told me so far is they're describing, someone's describing a situation where they come home and barks, the the dog is barking, howling, carrying on like crazy until they get in and greet the dog. So then, let me hear the second part. Uh, so when they're watching TV, the dog will periodically bark wanting constant touch and petting and is, uh, is, is needy while they're watching TV. I kind of already answered that in the previous question. So it's, it's a training process. I mean, both of those are. It, I mean, I address both of them, but you know, to just just recap, um, I will demonstrate the red light, green light, because you know a lot of times I was talking about people. Oh, you can So you know, switching from you know barking. It also depends on if the dog's over the threshold. If the dog's over the threshold. And he's just frantic and barking, there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter. Just go in, comfort him, and then figure out how you're going to make him more comfortable with staying home alone or with you returning. Because I don't know from the question, has the dog been barking the whole time you've been gone? And he's super upset at being home alone because that's a whole different problem. Or does he just go crazy? Is it like a, a demand barking thing? A, a consequences inducing bark to get you to come in and see him. I mean, that's where you have to go back through those those topics and consider what's really happening because there's, there's not an answer just to dog is barking, what do I do? I mean, that's what this whole talk was about, right? But when you're approaching the door, I, you know, the red light, green light game is, is super important and you have to be fast. So again, dog is over there I'm trying to get to him while he's quiet. He's quiet right now. I'm going to try to get over there, you know, to open the door, and then he starts barking again. So I'm going to stop. I don't just go in and open the door anyway, because now I'm reinforcing the barking again. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to maybe turn away. I'm going to, you know, maybe I take one step back. But again, I don't go back where I started because I'll never get there. He stops barking to take a breath. I Try to get over there and get the door open. If, he, if I get my hand on the doorknob and he starts barking again, I stop. It's a dramatic change. It's not, it's not this, you know, kind of thing. It's, I'm trying to get the door open, dog. I didn't get to. Dang it. Okay, I'm trying to get it open. I did get it open, and I'm in. Right? So that's what you're looking for in the red light, green light game, which could be useful when your dog's barking like crazy and you come home. But again, if your dog is over threshold and he's been barking like crazy for a long time, it doesn't matter what you do. Just go and help him. 
Okay, so two more that are probably related to the last one about barking when the attention is somewhere else. Maybe you already answered. Uh, tips for a dog who barks when the person's on the phone or when they're talking to their spouse. Oh, that's a good one. Um, so when dogs bark when you're on the phone or when you're talking to your spouse, that is super common. And they're, I mean, totally, just like little kids, we condition dogs to carry on and do bratty things when we're trying to talk on the phone. We do. So you can totally create a controlled situation, though, for talking on the phone, right? So we just need to teach him another behavior to do when we're on the phone. Um, so there's a couple approaches. We can just get in, I know I'm going to be on the phone, so I'm going to give you something to do. I'm going to give you a series of food puzzles to do over here on the floor, you know, while I'm talking on the phone. So you've circumvented the problem by heading the dog off down a road to do something while you're going to be talking on the phone. Then another approach is to teach him, because your stimulus is, you pick the phone up, dog says, oh, she picked the phone up. Now I'm going to bark at her. They totally do that. So what you want to do is teach them that mom picked the phone up. Oh, I should go get my toys out and play. I should go lay on my mat. I should lie right next to mom calmly until she gets off the phone. What do you want him to do? And then you train it. You just train it. And, and you just, first they have to be able to do the behavior, whatever you've envisioned. Um, so, you know, let's talk about mat behavior. If you want to lay on mat while you're on the phone, you're going to set it up so he does. You're going to practice, pick the phone up, get on your mat. Great, here's your treats. You're going to feed him. You're going to pretend to talk on the phone. You, maybe you give him a stuffed calm. You hang the phone up, you take the calm away, and you walk away and he gets up. That's one repetition. You set it up so he did it, and you move on training him. Um, in the meantime, until you get it pretty well perfected, you're probably going to have to give him food puzzles and cons and things on his mat while you're on the phone. Um, and it's the same thing when you're interacting with your spouse. I've done this with many clients. They just want to get involved. They're like, Let, yeah, let's all, you know, get in this conversation or this hug fest or whatever. So we just have to teach them that that means go away lie down, be calm, go do something else, whatever it is you've decided. And you can start with one thing and then build it into something else. So you may start with, if you're going to have a conversation with your spouse, and sometimes conversation means hugging and all that kind of mushy stuff too, right? Just ask your dog to lie down. Teach him to lie down. Feed him treats, hug. Feed him treats, hug. If he gets up, get him back. Feed him treats, hug. So you're teaching him what to do while this is going on, right? One more question. Uh, is there, are there any different techniques you'd recommend for multiple dogs? Because obviously once they get going, it's like you can't hear anything. Yeah, techniques for multiple dogs. So I just updated a blog post on my website about um, multi-dog households. And one of the big things that I covered in there is, yeah, multiple dogs are multiple problems, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, what you have to do, and this is what everybody, not everybody, people tend to be so reticent about ever separating the dogs. But you can't train five dogs. You can't even train two dogs. You you have to separate the dogs and make sure, you know, make sure they have the component skills that you need to conquer the task at hand. So remember when we did the talk on uh, positive reinforcement, it treats are only the beginning. We talked about constructional training and, and teaching components. So if dogs are going crazy, barking all at a mass because the other dogs barked, First of all, they have to be able to do something else, lie down, sit, something, stand quietly, 
And then they have to be able to do that in the presence of one other dog who's quiet. Then they may have to do it in the presence of two or three other dogs that are quiet. And only then are you going to be able to introduce one barking dog and you still can sit or lie down, right? Because it's a huge change and there's a huge stimulus that is driving them to an innate behavior, which is barking. I mean, when everybody else barks, you bark. Um, there was that one study that I told you about where they found more barking in group house dogs and in single house dogs in kennels. They stimulate each other to bark. Barking is easy, it's innate, and they're going to do it unless you actively teach each one how to be quiet and then how to be quiet while others are barking. And only then are you going to be able to start to put them together in small groups. If you just have two dogs, then yeah, you teach each one, you teach them to be together when you're quiet, and then maybe you have the other one barking over there and you teach this one to lie down over here and slowly decrease the distance between them. But you have to do it with both until they can both do the skill together quietly. And it's, it's a big job because it, again, as I stated at the beginning, it's not just stop barking. It's create a whole different trajectory for the animal to go down, which includes emotional response and outcome response. So I believe that was our last question, and we are out of time. So thank you so much for joining, and I look forward to seeing you again next month.